King David. Today we'll be discussing the aftermath of the great battle between David and Goliath, where the Israelites, because of David's trust in God and obedience and faithfulness, were able to defeat not only Goliath, but the Philistines. As we look at this passage of Scripture today, we want to look at four things that occur as we walk with the Lord. Four important points, I believe, to be shared that will help us, will equip us as we live a life following Christ. Now, if you're someone here today that does not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never determined that it's the right course of action for you to follow Jesus, prayerfully, you'll see that need today. And you will begin that journey that is filled with a lot of excitements, a lot of ups, a few downs, because life is like that anyways. But great fulfillment, and the payoff in the end is out of this world. Do I get it? That's what I'm talking about, yeah. <laughs> so if you'll please stand with me as we read 1 Samuel chapter 18. We'll be covering the first nine verses of 1 Samuel chapter 18. Verses 1 through 9. Now when he had finished speaking unto Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father, to their, his house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Aren't you glad I didn't sing that? <laughs> Maybe that's something we can work on with our praise man. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. As we begin to explore the principles found within these four thoughts that will be shared this morning, I do ask that you just teach our hearts, encourage us, prepare us for the days to come. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You have to see you tonight. The good, the bad, the ugly applies to David's life, but it also applies to our lives as well. We've seen some, some really good, good things in David's life already. He's been anointed king, or he will be the king. He has been given a cushy job in the palace to play the harp, to soothe King Saul's soul. He was there, in, instrumental there, no pun intended, just an <laughs> instrument. The Dutch, where the hell I need all right, and also we saw he was able to thwart the Philistines through his actions to defeat a ten-foot-tall giant of a man. Some really good things occurred. We're going to see some more good today, but we're also going to see some bad creeping into his life. For David, even though he was called by God, a man after his own heart was not immune to the difficulties of life either. Even in the midst of joy and happiness, We'll see there's even some negative that can be brought in if we allow it, or if he would allow it to affect him. We too will be able to apply that to our lives. We don't always have to let, let <coughs> negatives hinder our walk with the Lord. We don't have to let that happen. But let's look first at some positives that come out of this passage today. Again, in verses 1 through 4, as we look at that, we see, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul... The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant 
because he loved him as his own soul. David found a friend. Our first thought I want to share today as we follow God, as we trust him and are obedient to him, is this. In faithfulness, strong bonds are formed. James Bonds, maybe? I don't know. 007 Bonds? I don't know. <laughs> I must be the smart one. Kate, okay. what? what was that, Supergirl? Wearing your old pink cape? Look like Hottie on steroids? Not my super Hottie, but the Hottie in the mountains. Happy birthday, by the way. Yeah. Real quick, everybody say, Happy birthday to Alicia. Happy birthday to Alicia. Happy birthday to Alicia. Happy birthday to you. So you didn't get left out. <laughs> Yours was even live. Yours was in tape delay. So anyhow, let's go to the point. As we're faithful to the Lord, God will give us strong bonds. He will bring to us people who can be lifelong friends. This picture is your Charlie's Angel, James Bond 007 picture, but this picture actually is a picture of reality. James, Brian, and myself have been close for years. Obviously, Brian and I come from the same mama and daddy. So we were close. We're like 18 months, or 18 month marks. It's 18 months, 20 months apart. James came into our lives in 1990. And we've been best friends ever since. We've been through some good times. We've been through some pretty bad times. And there have been a few ugly times too, huh, James? <laughs> we talked about that yesterday on the way home from the movies. Too bad you weren't with us. Adam. You'd be like, ooh, well, now I know why he's like that. <laughs> but what brought us together, the three of us together, was the Lord. We met James in Atlanta as a teenager. And we were able to develop a great friendship, a bond. Jonathan and David were brought together by the Lord. And they had a great bond between them. They loved each other like brothers. We always tell James, I tell everybody that James is our little brother. Because he is. We're family. We love James. I love his mama too. Hey, Barbara, I'm so glad you're here. Good night. Yes, your mom. I'm glad, by the way, sidebar for just a second. I'm glad that my dad is here and he canceled his service today so he could have a free Barbara church. So. I'm glad you came despite not having church at your church. I forgot to tell her it was 10 o'clock and I love Oh, well, good thing she would have been early then. But God will do that for every one of us. The river, the same can and should apply to us at the river. We're family. There should be a strong bond there for us because each of us who, who takes that step of faith and trust in Christ, we become family. Was it Sister Sledge in 1979 with Pittsburgh Beards? Oh, Carol, you have just dated yourself. <laughs> but I did too because I know that song. I remember when it came out. We are family. All my brothers, sisters, and you're all my brothers and sisters in Christ. Jonathan and David were brought together by God. We have all been brought together too by our Lord. It's no coincidence that you're here today. It's no, uh, no random act that caused you to be in this midst. The Lord wanted you here. The Lord has brought you here to be with us so that we can praise God together <laughs> and fellowship together and we can learn from His Word together so that when we go out as we say and do life, we're there for one another. A brother falls, we're there to pick him up. A sister has something great happen, we're there to lift her up and say, yes, awesome. If someone in our midst is selling jewelry, we're there to rack them and have fun with them, aren't we, James? By the way, I learned something yesterday. Hairspray is bad on jewelry. It is. 
And this morning, when Doris was putting her hair around, I was like, Amber said you can't do that. <laughs> I'm going to use that on the way home and the way back. Whenever you get that hair around, like, Amber said hello. <laughs> it's not in my presence. I'm going to wear jewelry every day just for that. <laughs> I love her. I, love her. <laughs> I did listen. I got tickets to prove it. <laughs> so as we trust God, God will give us family and friends to be there for one another. Now I want to point this out too. Jonathan's father is King Saul. And I want to go ahead and give you a little future, well, for them to be the future, for us a little preview of what's to come. Saul was not going to be really all that enamored with David shortly, but Jonathan never will break that friendship. His love for him was so strong. Their bond was so so tight that he was there for him even in the lowest points of David's life. Even put himself at risk on David's behalf. And I want you to know today, everyone here, that's what we are. We're a strongly bonded family that's been formed by Jesus Christ. And when we say you hurt, we hurt for you, we're there for you. When good things happen, we rejoice with you. For that's what God wants us to do. That's his will for us at the river, us as followers. Now, a second thought I want to go to and point out that we found in verse 5. So David went out wherever Saul sent him. By the way, Saul likes him right now because he just slain a giant and made him look good. Okay? Because they, he's like the king and they just defeated this monster army. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and he behaved wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's service. Not only faithfulness will bring us strong bonds of friendship, but also in our faithfulness that we practice wisdom, our influence increases. Chuck Norris, the baddest man on the planet. <laughs> You've all heard the jokes about Chuck Norris, I'm sure. Yeah, I don't want to go through all five million of them, but they're true. Most of them. <laughs> As we act wisely with what responsibilities we're giving, are given, more influence increases. We're able to reach other people. David, because of his wise act activity, whenever he was given a task, he followed the, the old acronym WWJD. What would Jesus do? His was WWGD at that time. What would God do? But he didn't know Jesus at that point. Jesus had not manifested on earth in his earthly ministry. But he followed God. He, he asked himself, what would the Lord have me do in this situation? And because he did and behaved according to the wisdom given to him by God, blessings followed. His responsibility to increase his influence on other people was known. See, back to that verse, if we go back to the verse, he was sent over the men of war and was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Everybody began to accept him and look to him as someone who had answers they needed, someone they could follow. And this is from the same person who was still young, who's prior resume before Goliath and before playing the harp was he tended the sheep out in the field the lowest of low job, lowly jobs but he did that well and he did it to the glory of God and the Lord kept, continued to bless him and give him more he will eventually become king of Israel because of his wisdom. And by the way, that wisdom and that activity of trusting the Lord can be passed on. Solomon, his son, who was known as the wisest person to ever live, asked God for wisdom. How do you figure that he knew to ask God for wisdom? He saw it through his father. 
David, who didn't always act wisely, who we're going to get some ugly later on in this series, but he saw someone who loved God. And he saw someone who was blessed by God. When we act wisely, God gives us influence and ability to reach people. When people see the Lord in our lives, they know they need that as well. We at the river, each one here, we have the same opportunity to practice the wisdom of the Lord as David had. It's as simple as trusting God, studying His Word, and applying what God reveals to you. That's to be wise. Applying the knowledge that you've been given. I know that if I went over to the outlet over there and took the little cover, protective cover off, and stuck my finger in there, I know that it would be a hair-raising experience, most likely. I have that knowledge, yes. Now, if I don't act on that knowledge and refrain from sticking my finger in there, I'm not applying that knowledge. I'm not being very wise, am I? You can know God's Word and what He teaches in His Word from front to back, verse by verse, by memory. But if you don't apply it to your life, don't blame God for your life being in the state it might be in. But God said, well, you've been very wise. And also, let me just say, bad things happen. Even, bad things can happen in your life even when you are wise in serving the Lord. But here's the thing. You can deal with it because you know God's there for you. God can comfort you. He can cover the pain. In fact, not just cover it, but He can take it from it, from it, and move you beyond it. David was a wise individual, and because of that, his influence increased. Now, a third thought I want to share. Let's go look at, let's look at verses 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. Now, it had happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, he was a successful general, by the way, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul. They came to meet King Saul. Okay? David was doing the fine, but they came to meet King Saul. I want you to remember that for, for later. They came with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Now, I want you to watch this next video just for a moment. It's going to take about a minute. I trust, I trust, or trust me because I trust that you're going to enjoy this. And for some of you, it'll be great. Memory. Pittsburgh two, Atlanta one, with two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning in Game Seven of the National League Championship Series. The 2-0 pitch. Well hit, but hooking fouled and left. He had the green light on 2-0 and hammered it, but well fouled over the Pirate bullpen. And hit it very, very hard. Right in his wheelhouse, and it hooks foul. doesn't walk much. He walked only 17 times and 300 at bats in AAA this year. He hacked at the 2-0, now the 2-1. Line drive and a base hit! Just as the score of the tying run! Green to the plate! And he is safe! Safe at the plate! The Braves go to the World Series! Two outs. It was about midnight. The Braves were down two to one. Pittsburgh saw the opportunity. They knew they were going to the World Series. And Francisco Cabrera comes up. You heard they talked to AAA. He didn't get a lot of exposure. He didn't get a lot of the bats that year. Two outs. Two strikes. 
won their closure for the Pittsburgh Pirates, who had been the dominant team for two years. And Brace kept saying, I don't think so. One hit, and the slowest man on the planet, Sid Bream on second base. <laughs> he makes James look like a speed beat. <laughs> and if you've ever seen James run, it's amazing. <laughs> and he rounds the back, and I remember watching it. I'm like, go, go. I'm like, I'm a child. I'm a teenager, but I'm like, get, I'm like, come on. I was like, you can do it. And when he slid, there was this moment where the umpire was like, say it was like slow motion, like, no. Ah! It was great. Which brings us to our next thought. We at least got a picture. Oh, our accomplishments should cause celebration. I can tell you that day. The Braves, as you saw that picture, were ecstatic. The fans were going crazy, both in person and who were watching on TV or listening to on the radio. <coughs> it was great celebration. As great a moment, see, you can see he didn't touch. He's like, no. He said, drat. <laughs> I didn't get it. He was like, I'm fashion though. <laughs> When David returned to the army, the people of Israel celebrated the victory. They were excited. And they sang praise, or praises for what had occurred. Let's think about the river. Last week, 70 people. Praise God. When we were at Life Springs, when Daniel came and was baptized, gave his life to the Lord, praise God. When Oliver, at a little young age of five years old, asked Jesus to be his Lord and Savior, we rejoiced. When Amber and Terry <laughs> finally showed back up to church because of Jason and Robert, yes. <laughs> that's who we should have called at first, came, we were like, Every time God moves and gives us victory, we should celebrate it. We should rejoice in heart. Anything that God does, we should give glory to Him. If there's any reason to be happy, it's when God does something for us. By the way, He's done something for every one of us. If he's your Lord, he gave you eternal life. And there's nothing more that we'd be happier about. We celebrate not for our accomplishments, it's what we personally do, but what God does through us and for us. As great as that day it was in 1992, it didn't last. It's now a memory. <coughs> what God does for us is not only memory, but it's lasting memory. It goes on into eternity. Forever and ever. Trusting Christ as your Lord and Savior. Following Him in the good times and the bad times. Turning to Him even when we experience the ugly times a cause for celebration because we know our God is bigger and better and greater than any issue. Points and thoughts. You know, we know that God will, in fact, give us strong bonds. They're formed. Lifelong relationships. Knowing that as we are wise in our actions and our, uh, our thoughts as we serve the Lord, our influence increases. Seeing that our accomplishments that that occur do cause us to celebrate and glory to God. Those are positive. Those are good. And guess what? When we experience those things, there are others who do not appreciate that. Satan does not want us to have victory in glory. He does not want us to want us to celebrate what God is doing in our lives. 
He doesn't want us to be happy. Which brings us to our final thought. If you'll look here in verse 8 and in verse 9. Then Saul was very angry. And the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands. And to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can you have? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Now before we share the final final, but I want to just point that out. You've got, first off, they're ascribing to Saul, they're giving him credit for slaying thousands, right? I think that's a pretty impressive number. And they're saying that David has ten thousands. Okay, that's more than Saul's thousands, but Saul was the king, right? So that was good for him too. Thousands and ten thousands. Maybe they got together and moved to hundreds of thousands of combined. The enemies that were, were slain. Saul should have been praising God, saying, Hey, I'm glad I've got David here who's serving me. Remember, David wasn't trying to take the throne from Saul. There was. <coughs> David was serving. Saul. He was doing what he was commanded to do. But yet, in the midst of those great blessings, this occurs. Jealousy can occur in the midst of blessing. Now, if you can see that picture, you got probably Oliver and, I don't know, I hope not Kylie, but... Better not be. Kylie. And let's see. Amber. 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 Amber and Amber's like... Not Amber. Amber. Just to clear Amber. Amber. Okay. I'm going out on a limb. I think everybody would probably be confident that that would probably better not take place. <laughs> or maybe it's Eli. Okay? <laughs> Eli and Olivia. Still Amber. Sorry, Amber. Amber's like... <laughs> Sometimes in the midst of something good that occurs, others are jealous. They don't like it. For Ember's sake, now we're going to switch. That's Ember and all you parents. Can. Ember and we'll just say that Cheyenne over there is saying something. Saul did not like what was going on. He wanted all the attention. He didn't want joy or happiness. Now why was Saul that way? Remember, at the beginning of our at the beginning of our series, Saul was going to soon be deposed as king, replaced because he did not have a heart for God. He was disobedient to the Spirit of the Lord. He did what he wanted to do, as opposed to doing and following what God would have him to do as the king of Israel. Know this, and many of you have probably experienced this recently throughout the entire membership and body of here of Christ that comes to the river, you will come under attack. There will be people who will be jealous of what God's doing in your life. And it's not people that are really causing that. It's the principalities of the air. In, in the book of Ephesians, 6th chapter, verses 10 through 18, it's a passage that talks about the armor of God. And we're told that our enemy is not flesh and blood. The enemy are the demons that influence people to do wrong. People who take their, in, in baseball terms, their eye off the ball. Spiritual terms, they take their eyes off of God. We have to be very mindful of that. That we don't become that. But also understand that there are going to be people who are going to occasionally say things that are not very kind to us. There are going to be people who will, sometimes more times than we'd like, say and do things that are just wrong. Even inside the church, it can happen. There are times where I have, I've been at 
associational meetings where different churches come together and meet and listen to people. And when they hear good news about other churches, instead of being like, praise God, it's like, well, you know, that's just because they're giving out free candy. I'm not going to tell you what church I want you here. Uh, I'll give you some candy later. <laughs> <laughs> what about me? <laughs> okay, I'll give all y'all candy. Just go to Grandma's house. She's got dumb dumb suckers in the bowl. You can. Uh, <laughs> no, those are for me. <laughs> like that. I'll share one with you. <laughs> it ought not happen in the church, but it does. Why? Because many times we as believers forget it's not about me. Myself and I. It's about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's about God. Even though jealousy can occur in the midst of blessing, I want you to check it out. At the end of that, that phrase, that prepositional phrase, start teaching school again. I have to remember that stuff. In the midst of blessing, blessings do occur. Our focus should be at the end of the sentence, not the beginning. Understand jealousy occurs, but praise God that blessings are there. Look beyond the problem and look to the solution. Look to Jesus, and what He's provided, what you already have. Years ago, as we go into a time of reflection and invitation, years ago when I was a senior, going into my senior year at Ruth Parker, my wife and I. Had our first child. He's not here today because the Lord took him home seven hours after birth. It was a devastating time in our lives. But through the whole situation, and it was a whirlwind because we had no time, we didn't have to do nothing was going on with the pregnancy. 23 and a half weeks alone, senior in college newlyweds it happens but you know in the midst of that tragedy God's love covered us and it became a testimony we actually had people come to us and say how do you do this and awkward. every time I said because Jesus is my Lord Jesus is there for us so in the midst of bad things, no blessings are there. We just got to look. If you're someone now who's dealing with God, you just need to take this off. <laughs> Suddenly, my, my voice is not echoing as much. Very definitely. Oh, no, no, he's on. See that red? It's not my fault. Anyhow. the battery Does it? Is that right? Green means it's not right. It was red earlier. Anyhow, let's go back to what's important. If you're dealing with something, don't keep it. Don't keep it to yourself. Give it to God. Give it to the cross. Give it to the Maybe God is speaking to your heart if you can understand Maybe God's speaking to your heart and He's saying, come to me. Maybe you're someone who's never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never took an, taken that step to follow Him. No better time than the present. Maybe you're someone, again, that has felt that the Lord is moving you to formally join us at the river. Do I have a burden? We've already seen the altars open at all times have a burden that you're holding, something you need to give to God, give it to Him. He will take your burden. He will lift that yoke of oppression off you. You just got to trust Him.
formally join us in the river. Thank <laughs> you. 